Welcome to the China Media Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Fulton, a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and a political scientist at Zayed University in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. A recurring theme throughout this show has been that Middle Eastern countries have complex relationships with China. Nothing is as simple as the headlines would have us believe. The Sino-Israeli bilateral relationship is particularly complicated. Dense economic relations have to be considered against the deeper and much more important Israeli relationship with the U.S. And while China does a lot of business with Israel, its support for Palestine and international forums puts a ceiling on political cooperation with Tel Aviv. To understand the dynamics of the China-Israel relationship, I'm joined today by Asaf Orion. Asaf is a senior researcher at the Institute of National Security Studies and the director of the Diane and Guilford Glazer Israel-China Policy Center in Tel Aviv, Israel. Prior to joining INSS, he had a 32-year career in the Israeli Defense Forces, where in his final posting, he served as the head of strategic division in the IDF General Staff's Planning Directorate, responsible for strategy and policy planning, international cooperation, military diplomacy, and liaison to the neighboring militaries and peacekeeping forces. Since then, he's been keeping busy thinking, writing, and working on Israel-China relations Asaf, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jonathan, and thanks for inviting. Oh, of course, pleasure. So can we start with just a general overview of the Israel-China bilateral relationship? Which issues are at a high level of engagement and which in- issues are underdeveloped or, or non-starters at this point? Uh, historically speaking, we should uh, understand the different chapters in the Israel-China history. Uh, from from its uh, its beginning, uh, it was uh, overshadowed by the Cold War, uh, in which it was uh, very uh, clear that Israel is on the western uh, side of the blocks. From uh, 1979, uh, when uh, China uh, turned to the reform and opening up under uh, Deng, and uh, the U.S. established it, uh, its diplomatic ties, actually uh, Israel was encouraged by America uh, to support China in defense and military aspects after uh, China uh, was defeated in its uh, war in Vietnam. Uh, So then began a chapter of uh, about uh, two decades of uh, um, military and defense relations, uh, which were augmented by diplomatic ties between Israel and China only in 1992. Uh, The end of the 90s, however, following the third uh, crisis in the Taiwan Straits, uh, actually uh, marked an inflection point in the the military ties, because following two crises on uh, defense exports, one, the Falcon early warning uh, plane, and uh, the second is Harpy loitering munitions. Uh, These generated the crisis between U.S., which finally uh, or suddenly uh, woke up to China as a possible military rival in uh, Taiwan and then turned to Israel and said, hey, Israel, why are you uh, arming my potential rival? Uh, And uh, in 2007, these uh, crises uh, uh, culminated in a legal uh, step in Israel. uh, And uh, and since then, there is a law of uh, defense uh, export supervision or oversight, and um, basically no more military or uh, defense exposed to China uh, uh, since then. Uh, If we uh, move forward to uh, the decade of uh, 2011 and onwards, uh, the Netanyahu years, uh, these were um, a boost phase of economic uh, relations. And uh, Mr. Netanyahu as the prime minister uh, defined those relations as a marriage made in heaven. And uh, this uh, culminated in 2017, establishing a comprehensive innovative partnership uh, between Israel and China, which actually focus on technology, on uh, uh, innovation uh, cooperation, and so on, uh, followed by a lot of uh, Chinese activity in Israel's infrastructure and investment, mostly in technology. In recent years, I would say 
uh, that uh, you can see the watershed line beginning in Washington in 2017. Uh, in, in December, the Trump Trump administration published its national security strategy, uh, which basically said uh, two main things. One, China is my number one problem. Uh, two, technology is at the center of this great power competition. And Israel, in, in the recent years, and more so uh, under its uh, new government, now uh, facing another election, uh, actually uh, took a, a cool down or a chill down approach of a more cautious uh, uh, approach to its uh, relations with China. Um, so the combined, uh, I would say, effect of great power competition and COVID has seen a slowdown in many aspects of our, our cooperation. And uh, um, as I was uh, quote, quoted uh, in, in some uh, uh, papers in the beginning of August, the honeymoon is over, but this is not to understand that there is a divorce, but a less infatuated uh, uh, relations, I would say, uh, and more uh, cool-headed in, in a sense. When we look at the, the actual indexes, we can see growth in the volume of trade, uh, basically in goods, uh, we can see our uh, export, Israel's export to China has peaked in 2018 and is struggling since. It's, it's not uh, going uh, beyond the level of 2018. And on uh, export uh, services, it's very important to understand the, uh, the scale. Uh, while Israel is exporting $17 billion uh, a, a year to America in services, uh, it exp it's ex exports only uh, 170 million. Uh, so uh, you can see 1% of what we're doing with America, uh, we do with China on, on uh, services. So I think it needs to be understood, this relationship as a de developing uh, relationship, uh, deeply uh, affected by the great power relations, when the sun is shining on the U.S.-China uh, relation, well, it was easy. Uh, when there are, uh, it's uh, more uh, clouded and, and uh, stormy, uh, we are also uh, getting our cold. So that's consistent with what we've seen here in the, the UAE. I think that point that you mentioned, the national security statement, from the Trump administration in, in late 2017 was really the point where you could see a lot of, of countries having to, to recalibrate and think about the, the relationship with China in, in different terms. Um, I think it's also interesting how you framed it because, again, when we keep seeing these raw numbers and you see just a big spike, you know, this huge growth in, in China-Israeli trade or investment, and it looks so impressive. But like you say, you know, measured against, you know, a, a comparative approach really does show how you know, uh, deep or shallow it, it, it actually is. Um, so just, you know, I, I think it's another good point to put, you know, the, the, the COVID uh, effect that we've seen a lot of that around the region. A lot of what China's been doing in, in infrastructure contracting is slowed down uh, because of that. Uh, but what do you see in the, the near term, like in, in the, the short, you know, the, the years ahead, do you think China and Israel are going to get back to that pre-COVID, uh, pre-Trump era uh, level or or is it really a, a cooling down? Uh, I think uh, um, not all of it is is uh, due to what's happening between China and America. Much of it is coming from China itself. Like the peak of uh, Chinese investment in Israel was the 2018, and since then a drop. And w we believe that this is more uh, to have. Uh, with China's own uh, policy on uh, capital flow than on, on uh, bilateral issues between Israel and China. Uh, tourism, we saw growth up to a point of 170,000 uh, Chinese tourists per year, which was nice. But uh, again, if we take it uh, as uh, in, in proportion, Israel uh, uh, pre-COVID enjoyed the 3 million a year. So it's not a huge uh, tourist group. But at the same time, after COVID, uh, there was shutdown. So you hardly see uh, great delegations as uh, they used to be 
uh, much less uh, Israelis are going to China uh, to do business and, and so on. So much of it, uh, zero COVID and China's own uh, closing up, not opening uh, out, uh, are chilling effects of these. Uh, we see uh, more contentious uh, uh, aspects in, uh, in technology, uh, not because of the Trump administration, but because Israeli CEOs are thinking about their prospects, saying, okay, if I want to go west and I plan to market in America, having a Chinese investment in, in my company is a liability and not, uh, and not uh, a gain. So they're, they're much uh, more uh, cautious in that. And um, I, I would add that Israel's uh, part of the reconsideration, I think, is awakening to the fact that it's not the, the, the challenge with uh, China relations is not just not making America angry, as many people frame it, but China's own intricacies of how it's doing business and things that come uh, with uh, having relations with uh, China. And if we read well what's uh, going up uh, or going on uh, in the world, uh, you should uh, also keep uh, your eyes on uh, influence, on uh, uh, corruption issues, o although China is not alone in that. We're quite good at it ourselves. Uh, there are issues of uh, uh, in intervention in the political systems, of espionage and technology theft. Uh, definitely technology theft and espionage uh, are something that is uh, Israel should take care and be cautious, as uh, should every uh, uh, serious uh, or responsible uh, country. Uh, so... Since China um, went to implement strategically the military-civil uh, uh, fusion, so every civilian uh, application can be and will be used by the state security apparatus, it puts more constraints on, on uh, exports of uh, such technologies. We see uh, the difficult or the problematic uh, space expanding from uh, narrow military and defense to dual use and, of course, uh, emerging technologies which are uh, not uh, technically uh, dual use by the old Vassenaar definitions. So the whole export control regimes are being challenged. Uh, and still, even with all those uh, caveats and difficulties, uh, we see prospects to benefit from China's markets and, and so on, as many countries, including the U.S., uh, do. And definitely when you look at uh, Israel's uh, uh, relative advantages on uh, uh, food uh, technology, on medical and health uh, technologies, on water technologies, and uh, things that are connected to, the, uh, connected to the climate crisis, all of these, I think, are still on the benign side that even if in a very contentious competition uh, between the U.S. and China, um, uh, this this should be, as we say, kosher uh, to uh, to continue and even to develop. So we need to be uh, sharper, better understanding the uh, the differential uh, parts of what we won't do with China, like military and and military applicable uh, issues, like things we'll do with China because they are benign and uh, things that we need to uh, spend more time to uh, figure out and, and understand. And I think we're not alone in this. The whole Western uh, Hemisphere is, uh, is uh, actually looking for uh, answers, for better uh, uh, solutions, for better definitions. You know, just uh, a traffic light of uh, red, green, and yellow is not rich enough to to capture the complexity of reality here. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. And I, I think you're right. You know, when you described earlier about the honeymoon stage, uh, it sounds like, you know, the more experience you have in any bilateral relationship, the more the, the glow starts to fade and you start to understand each other better and you, you see what you should be thinking more seriously about. And that seems to be what you're describing here. I think we're seeing that in a lot of places. Um, so, one thing you mentioned, there's a lot of infrastructure construction that's been taking place in, in Israel uh, with Chinese companies. 
this is interesting to me because I've been studying the BRI for, for several years. And it seems the countries that have played the biggest role in the BRI are those that connect beyond just, you know, those, those countries where projects link that country to other countries. You know, China, the BRI is all about connecting markets and, and connecting uh, across regions. So for the longest time, Israel, you know, is geographically has this this natural advantage with this Eastern Mediterranean position, but within its own region, wasn't really connected uh, to, to neighboring countries in a very meaningful way. And of course, since the Abraham Accords, we've seen that starting to change pretty dramatically as Israel sees its connections across the Middle East start to intensify. Um, do you think this experience uh, that Israel's had with China on infrastructure construction uh, can develop into projects that link uh, Israel with its its regional partners in Belt and Road type things. Uh, it's it's a very good question, but I I suggest you know before starting because BRI is a great uh, catchword, uh, the Silk Road with all the romance of uh, uh, his, history returning. Uh, it's returning to a point where Marco Polo started in Italy. But uh, we now hear that uh, BRI is in uh, Latin America and Africa where the Silk Road uh, never, never reached. Yes. So uh, Arctic. So uh, when, when, we, when we speak about the Belt and Road, I think we need to differentiate the, the real facts from the brand. And on, on um, the early years since 2013, when it was launched, it was like an unbelievable brand. Everybody uh, spoke about it. Everybody uh, wanted uh, to have a share in the wealth and prosperity it brought, in the glamour of you know the silk in the Silk Road. Uh, it it was uh, qu quite a festival. Uh, but I I believe uh, with over the years it became a more toxic, or or at least problematic brand. Um, you, you can see that our previous governments um, spent a lot of time speaking and romancing about the BRI and Israel's potential and even municipal level. Uh, mayors said, oh, my city will be part of the BRI, uh, you know, becoming uh, some center of the universe. No, you're uh, a small town on, in, in the outskirts of Western Asia. Uh, so... Uh, the brand, I think, is in decline. And uh, I would uh, also point to the fact that uh, um, China itself initiated another uh, initiative, the Global Development Initiative, which is a non-BRI, but dealing with development, which tells us something that uh, uh, China already identified that the brand has been maybe tarnished or, or at least less successful. And if you uh, look at the uh, pace of uh, countries joining BRI, it's on the decline. Like it again, it peaked in 2018, and now uh, you you see uh, uh, people stepping away from that. When we move from branding and and uh, you know images to actualities, yes, Israel uh, is in dire needs of heavy uh, infrastructure. And uh, uh, it saw China uh, come and compete here for desalination, for roads, for uh, uh, railroads, for light uh, rails and uh, tunnels, uh, ports, everything. Uh, uh, this again, Ch China's, um, I would say, participation in Israel's infrastructure had uh, peaked twice in 2015 and 19. And since then, we see a decline uh, to a point that they uh, actually compete uh, less. Uh, in the past, there, there was a talk about the railroad from Eilat on the Red Sea uh, to uh, the center of Israel um, uh, on the Mediterranean. There was also uh, some uh, talks, uh, very visionary, if not uh, fantastic, uh, of a railroad uh, through Jordan to Saudi Arabia and connecting us to the Gulf. Uh, definitely, um, China is a huge engine for such heavy, heavy uh, infrastructure. And should there be rails to connect 
uh, I guess that uh, Israel uh, will will try to connect. Uh, whether we call it BRI or not, which I'm skeptic, it depends much about the uh, uh, our next uh, government, and we're now heading into our fifth election. So you should you should check uh, before you uh, you decide. You know, every uh, uh, half a year or a year. Um, so on heavy infrastructure, I think there is still potential for. Uh, China, Chinese uh, contribution to what the region needs. Uh, but we also uh, need to recall that the BRI is also about digital uh, Silk Road and communication. On this, I've seen um, more enthusiasm in the Gulf, including Saudi Arabia and uh, the UAE and Qatar, I think, uh, like Huawei and, and ZTE infrastructure. Uh, Israel is much more conservative, not to say a total outlier on communication security. And unlike uh, others, including the five eyes, uh, we don't have a, a, a by date uh, to clean up our network from uh, Huawei, like as the UK and the US and, and uh, others, because we don't have uh, Chinese components uh, uh, core components in, in our uh, cellular uh, networks from uh, second generation, not only fifth that are now uh, building. So if, uh, if the BRI regionally comes with a communication package, I am not sure that uh, Israel will, uh, will connect and subscribe uh, to that. That being said, President Biden visiting uh, Saudi Arabia also uh, included some uh, proposals for 6G and 5G uh, development and deployment, which seems to be competing uh, with what uh, China is, uh, is uh, proposing. So I think we're seeing uh, the competition uh, still in, uh, in place. And uh, as, as I said, BRI became a bit uh, more toxic and it actually uh, spurred some uh, approach that I call uh, the chastity belt and road because there is an expectation that you won't touch uh, anything of China. And I think this expectation is a bit uh, uh, overemphasized. You're always one for the pithy phrase, Asaf, the chastity belt and road. I'm sure that's going to be the tagline this is for what this people episode. Will re recall, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good point. I mean, so yeah, the, the Belt and Road really was, there was a lot of branding going on, but you know, beneath it was the fact that Chinese state-owned enterprises were really good at doing these overseas infrastructure construction projects. And, you know, we saw this, you know, one of the things that we didn't hear a lot about after the Al Ola, uh, you know, meeting that ended the, the GCC feud was, you know, talk of recommitting to this Arabian Peninsula rail, railway link. And you can see, you know, like you mentioned this, the red med or or talk of this land bridge you really can see how if, if xi jinping goes to saudi arabia this, this december or next march whenever he does go i wouldn't be surprised if if there's a lot of energy for chinese soes to get involved in those types of projects and this could be something that could be beneficial for israel bri or not you can see how you know there would be some synergy there um but just yeah, on, 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 inf on infrastructure in general, I, I think we, we need to differentiate between things they come, they build, they leave, like our Ashdod port, and uh, where they stay and operate, which means more dependence, reliance, and access uh, that needs uh, uh, more care and, and attention. But, you know, just when you mentioned the, the port, I mean, the port in Haifa, of course, is something that got a lot of media attention. But this kind of fits in with it, right? Like, like that port links up with a lot of other Chinese managed ports in the Mediterranean, uh, in the Red Sea. This is something that really does link up different markets and ports. So, um, I don't know. Do, do you could you tell us a little bit about that? I, I know we didn't discuss the the Haifa port beforehand, but I think it's something that especially American audiences often point to and think of, uh, you know, an Israeli uh, vulnerability in the relationship with China. Yeah, Haifa got uh, Haifa port, which is actually uh, the Haifa Bay port, which is an 800 meters uh, wharf in the Haifa Bay uh, port uh, uh, complex. 
And it was um, after many years of, of hardship in uh, Israel's uh, throughputs, uh, through the two ports uh, we had, Haifa and Ashdod, our government in 2011 decided to try to double the volume by privatizing, actually going against the union, the labor unions of the ports, which uh, are holding uh, the country by, by its throat. So uh, Israel said, okay, let's, uh, let's privatize, uh, double and privatize the, the two new ones, one in the south, one in the uh, north. In the south, as I said, in Ashdod, uh, a Chinese company uh, built it and left, and now it's run by a Swiss-Dutch uh, company. In Haifa, another company built it, and uh, uh, Shanghai International Port Group uh, operates it, which means uh, some uh, cranes are in uh, Haifa, and they're uh, loading and unloading uh, uh, container uh, ships in, in Haifa. It, it means that uh, about uh, 8 to 10 uh, Chinese management uh, uh, crew is, is here, working with 100 uh, Israelis, with a lot of uh, uh, security authorities, uh, potential to check whatever we, we uh, uh, see. And the great buzz of the Haifa port was created in a 2018 uh, conference um, that was uh, three years after the tender uh, was signed with no American competitors even bidding. So uh, in this conference, uh, a former uh, Navy admiral, U.S. Navy admiral, said, you know, if the Chinese operate it, the Sixth Fleet might not be able to uh, uh, come to port calls in, uh, in Haifa uh, because of espionage issues. Now, you could uh, argue about the value of, uh, of cranes uh, for espionage. I'm not belittling it. Uh, just for proportion, uh, the same company producing those cranes uh, is holding a 70% market share globally. And if uh, uh, a Chinese uh, crane inhibits the use for U.S. Navy, well, may maybe the uh, you know battle for the seas or the oceans is already already uh, won. And I don't think that's uh, correct, but. Why should I um, make an effort and explain it instead of mentioning that since it started operating in September 2021, three port calls by U.S. Navy ships uh, already occurred in Haifa. And uh, I think it, it uh, says a lot about uh, what uh, America and American Navy really think about this actual uh, threat. So there's a huge straw man there. But I don't think we, we should dismiss uh, China's challenges uh, to advanced uh, high-tech democracies. And uh, we understand by reading the current national security strategy, the previous national security strategy, and China's own uh, stress on technology. We just saw some nominations into the Politburo with a heavier uh, weight to technology people uh, space people, the cosmos club, so to speak, uh, at the expense of, of, uh, economy or economists. So we understand that technology is a big thing. We also remember that Israel is a big technological, uh, uh, player punching above its weight. And this is why, uh, China is, uh, uh seeking a comprehensive innovative partnership with us. So if, the main focus is uh, technology and safeguarding Israel's technology is it, making sure that it doesn't leak or we don't lose it to China and so on and so forth. We should focus our uh, efforts on uh, countering uh, tech transfer and tech loss uh, to, to China rather than uh, uh, running after the Haifa port flare or chaff, it depends which homing uh, system you are. So uh, reading uh, the books about uh, Chinese uh, industrial espionage and quest for foreign technology, uh, there's a great book uh, by uh, Routledge on, on Routledge on uh, uh, beyond espionage. Uh, we, 
we, we understand that there are like 30 methods of uh, tech transfer, some of them legal, some of them illicit, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, Haifa port and investments are just two. And we need to take a systemic approach looking at all 30. That's really helpful. Because, um, you know, what we see is, uh, you know, again, a lot of headlines about how, you know, China's going into Haifa and it's going to really, you know, subvert a lot of, of, of what Israel or the U.S. strategy in the region. And I think you just gave us a really good uh, counter argument. Um, kind of switching track, just looking domestically within Israel, you know, uh, you've, you've mentioned a few times the, the endless election cycle, which must be exhausting. Um, how does China feature in, in the domestic discourse in, in, in Israeli domestic politics? Is there a sense among public that more engagement with China is a good or a bad thing? Or do people even think much about China? Um, China is not a great uh, election uh, issue. If there is a good election issue, we're uh, mostly uh, about uh, our own uh, tribal, uh, you know, camps and, and so on and so forth. Um, Israel is, is, a, is a country uh, living under many security threats, existential, military, defense, and, and so on and so forth. China is not an enemy. China is not a military threat. China is hardly even a defense issue. Uh, so it enjoys, uh, um, I, I would say, an exceptionally good uh, uh, image in Israel. The reputation is, is, is good. Uh, it's, it's rather uh, um, amiable in, in this sense. But we also need to, uh, to look at the trend. Back in 2019, after, I think, consecutive years of uh, governments in Israel, very supportive of, of uh, China relations, it was like El Dorado, you know, go and make money uh, in, in uh, China. And uh, looking at uh, the Pew poll from 2019, in America, there were about 66% uh, uh, negative positions on China. And in Israel, there were 60 something percent positive to China and 26 negative. In 2022, uh, the Pew poll showed that America even uh, more uh, uh, went, uh, went even more uh, negative to 82 or 84 uh, percent uh, negative. And Israel uh, corrected, I would say, to uh, uh, 48 uh, positive and 46 negative. So it's now a more balanced uh, uh, view on, on China, like 20 points uh, decline. Uh, I think uh, China did a lot of self damages in the Wolf Warrior diplomacy, in uh, being hard handed on Australia, on Lithuania. Uh, uh, America has a voice in Israel. Uh, when we're talking about, okay, 66% uh, positive uh, to China and Israel in uh, 19, America is above 80, 83, 88. It's, uh, it's not by mistake that uh, President Trump says, oh, I'm so popular there. I could have been uh, the prime minister. America is very popular and loved in, in Israel. So uh, I think it's, um, it's something that informs itself from world events. But uh, we should also remember that uh, Israel is very Middle East focused. Uh, there is hardly good coverage of what's happening in East Asia. Uh, China is not a big thing in our press. You don't see many of it, uh, uh, many news about it. Um, and um, perhaps uh, mostly on the economic uh, uh, magazines. But on the geo-strategic aspects, very little presence. So on the whole, uh, since it's not coming from the threat flank, it's uh, still considered as an e economic uh, partner, a promising economic partner. And even its uh, uh, regional uh, policies of supporting the Palestinians uh, in words, and uh, helping Iran circumvent sanctions 
and uh, uh, developing weapon systems uh, that some of them Israel was on the re receiving end of. We were hit by uh, a Chinese model uh, missile uh, produced in Iran and shot or launched by Hezbollah in 2006. We lost four men on a missile boat. So I, I would say the image is, is uh, more or less benign with growing, at, uh, um, I would say, awareness of threat, of risk, and of implications to our relations with the U.S. That's very clear. If there's one thing you'd ask Israelis is that doing anything with China today needs to be uh, done with your uh, uh, eyes to the rear view mirror of what America thinks about it. And as we know in mirrors, objects are closer than they appear. That's great. Um, so you mentioned a couple of things that I want to go into, and you know, Palestine being one of them. You know, China has a special envoy uh, for the Israel-Palestine issue. Uh, they've offered at different points to act as a mediator uh, to, to varying degrees of, of interest. Um, it's issued lots of statements in the United Nations and the press. Uh, in response, we've heard some pretty frank comments from Abbas on China, remarkably frank um, comments about what he thought of China and what China could do. Um, and we've also heard lots of Israeli dissatisfaction with Chinese rhetoric and, and actions on this issue. How is China seen on this issue from an Israeli perspective? Like, does anybody think that China has the answer to this this problem? And, you know, when China injects itself into this, is it seen as useful or 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 otherwise? Uh, one of our uh, colleagues in the RAND uh, Corporation, uh, Andrew Scobell, once uh, wrote about uh, China in the Middle East as being uh, an economic heavyweight, a political uh, lightweight, and uh, military featherweight. On, on the Palestinian issue, uh, well, you, you see the political overtures, the positions, I would say, are so stale. Uh, you think you're, you're in, back in 1964. Uh, uh, it, it resonates uh, the old support to the liberation uh, movements of the mid-60s, like uh, I, I think it carries a, a Maoist uh, uh, legacy. And um, this uh, automatic uh, support, yes, they're saying the right things about uh, the both sides' uh, rights to, uh, uh, to live in peace and so on. But they already recognize the state of uh, Palestine. And uh, whenever there's uh, condemnations uh, to be done, they usually come our way. Uh, all votes in the UN are against us. And, and uh, when you look at the opportunity side, once in a while, uh, China publishes a four-point plan, five-point plan. All the plans are the same. Uh, the level of uh, political heft actually doing the, the heavy lifting uh, needed for negotiations are not there. China is not even uh, doing what Japan is doing in trying to promote infrastructure uh, uh, for the Palestinians and Israelis, infrastructure for peace, very limited. And uh, when you look at the, the actual political activity, diplomatic activity, they hold conferences uh, in in uh, in China, fanfare uh, conferences between irrelevant Palestinians and irrelevant Israelis. Like this is hardly even a track two, I would say two and a half. Uh, so I don't think that beside when when Abbas uh, goes uh, and and uh, lords uh, China for standing by the Palestinians. Yes, but it's standing there with its, uh, with its uh, hands in its pockets. It's not doing anything. It doesn't want to stick its uh, uh, neck into a very problematic, uh, uh, you know, a very complex uh, problem set. It doesn't want to pay uh, the, the cost of failure because, well, when you're hosting uh, uh, complicated negotiations, uh, you need to also to explain the failures and not just uh, the uh, the victories or the wins. Uh, you don't see great money uh, 
uh, dangling to promote, you know, economic stabilization because China is not a great donor. It's an investor, yes, with economic uh, uh, logic, but it, it, it doesn't just uh, donate the way the U.S. does. You would, you would never see a Chinese uh, Marshall Plan uh, building any other nation in, in a serious uh, way unless they're building their own future business and infrastructure. So I think their, their participation in uh, the so-called peace uh, making is very symbolic. And, and uh, the, the Palestinian Authority, which is not really in the business of making peace, uh, uh, not that I think that the conditions now on our side are, are uh, suitable, but they are totally unsuitable right now. And uh, it's uh, good to have China as, as a declaratory uh, friend, uh, somewhere to go to, to say, yes, the uh, American, uh, uh, you know, American role is uh, incredible, unreliable. So uh, U.S. bashing uh, is, is great when you go to Beijing. But uh, do they really expect China to bring Israel to be able to mediate effectively, to be seen as an honest broker by, by both sides? Uh, uh, what with uh, China standing by Iran uh, too closely, saying nothing when Iran attacks its neighbors? Not really a good uh, starting position. So I think we, we need to be uh, um, differential in our approach and expectations from China. China is not a security guarantor in the Middle East. China is, is an interesting business and infrastructure partner. Yes, very. Uh, politically, it depends whether it serves its or not. And it's not in for heavy lifting or peacemaking or negotiations. Okay, well, that's perfect. Because when you mentioned Iran, that was the other thing I want to bring up from your previous comment, you know, that China's had this kind of balanced approach where it, you know, will work with both sides in, in very intense regional rivalries. And of course, it's worked with Iran in this comprehensive strategic partnership and in bringing it into the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. I've often argued that its engagement with the GCC is much more meaningful than what it does with Iran in real terms, whether economic terms or, or political terms. But it does prop up Iran in a way that probably people in Israel find problematic. So Israel, you know, China's approach to the Middle East in general, does it do you, how do you see it affecting Israel's regional interests? Is it a source of support or subversion, or is it something in between? Uh, as much as it's, uh, uh, let's say, promoting infrastructure and economy uh, and promoting uh, stabilization uh, through economic uh, prosperity, I think it's positive. Um, as much as it's, uh, you know, it's a non-partisan, it's not taking sides, it's a sort of uh, neutral, it's navigating between sworn enemies. Uh, one visit includes uh, uh, Xi's, uh, Xi, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, visit in 2016, included Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and uh, Iran. Saudi Arabia and, and Iran are not a love story. These are sworn enemies, existential uh, enemies. And uh, being able to walk both sides of, of, uh, of the Gulf and having comprehensive strategic partnerships with both. And yes, I agree, the, the volume of trade uh, between the Gulf states and uh, China is much more formidable than, than Iran. But geostrategically, let's let's look at uh, and let's look at at what uh, China does. Yes, it supported the JCPOA in a way. Yes, it doesn't push Iran. It it doesn't uh, help to uh, use sanctions as a good coercion uh, uh, leverage because Iranian oil is cheap and China needs it, so China buys it big time. Uh, I would uh, uh, point to the concerns in Israel about the military and defense clauses in the new uh, agreement, uh, which we saw the draft of, of uh, two years ago, uh, because we know that Iran uh, was already supported by China 
in its nuclear uh, uh, project, in the Isfahan uranium uh, uh, conversion facility, and in other parts, and I mentioned already missiles. So in this sense, uh, helping Iran out of isolation and helping it circumvent the, the uh, pressures to come to a better agreement, a longer and stronger or whatever, uh, is unhelpful. When Iran is attacking Saudi Arabia in 2019 or throughout the years that the Houthis uh, bombarded uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and even the Emirates, you didn't hear uh, China in public uh, say, Iran, why are you uh, going after energy security, that is tankers and oil fields and so on, which is a vital uh, Chinese uh, interest. And why are you uh, uh, launching and, and destroying uh, assets of uh, my other comprehensive strategic partners? Maybe they said it quietly, but we don't see China as a great restraint or restraining uh, uh, power. And last point, I think we need to spend some attention and time on uh, the new emergences of the, the actual uh, East Bloc of China, Russia, and Iran. When Iran is joining Russia's war in Ukraine and uh, China is more or less adopting Russia's narrative about the war, uh, blaming the US, blame, blaming NATO, uh, trying to sidestep the question of uh, using uh, military force to infringe on Ukraine's uh, uh, sovereignty and uh, territorial integrity. All of these are uh, high principles of, uh, of Chinese foreign policy. So you see more or less the emergence of a bloc around the uh, Shanghai Cooperation uh, group, uh, Organization, but also even just the trilateral part between China, Russia, and Iran is, is something that you can't just say, okay, they're, uh, uh, they're just doing business. It's beyond business. You see naval uh, exercises by Iranian, Chinese, and Russian vessels, navies, uh, near Iran. That's, that's uh, going, you know, beyond just holding hands in the, in the General Assembly. It's very real. And uh, the deeper it grows because of Russian necessity and isolation, because Iranian necessity and isolation, and uh, China's own more assertive, more uh, aggressive sometimes, and military buildup, we will uh, end up seeing more, and we do see already more uh, Chinese weapon systems flying around the Middle East, uh, China helping uh, Saudi Arabia to uh, promote uh, uranium extraction, China helping uh, uh, Saudi Arabia with ballistic uh, missile uh, development and uh, solid propellant, which means that China is uh, ushering the, the nuclear arms race uh, of the Middle East following the um, Iran uh, growing to be a threshold state. So in, in this sense, I, I think that uh, it's very evident that there is like a gap between China's role as an economic player in the Middle East, a big one uh, at that, uh, and its uh, defense and, and uh, uh, political uh, strategic uh, involvement, which is still pretty lightweight. And just one caveat, we see, I think, the early buds of uh, Chinese uh, military presence in the Middle East, uh, in, the, in the Djibouti uh, port, in, in uh, we heard about or read about uh, Port Khalifa uh, with uh, uh, Gwadar across the, the Gulf. I think China is slowly moving in to have more assets. I wouldn't go as far as uh, those who push the theory that it's displacing the, the United States or replacing it, because I don't think they're uh, providing those services. Uh, but uh, certainly they, they are making themselves ready to use military force one day.
Asaf, this has been really, uh, really fascinating, really fun for me. Uh, I always enjoy talking regional affairs with you, um, but we've we've gone on already. We've taken too much of your time. Uh, I'd encourage all of our listeners to check Asaf's profile page at INSS because we've got links there to all of his recent articles, uh, which are always very insightful and very useful. Do you have anything you've published recently that you'd like to, to share or promote? Uh, yes, I, I recently uh, published uh, a, a piece in a Mosaic magazine called No, Israel is not falling into China's orbit, uh, trying to diffuse a lot of uh, wrong assertions about Israel-China uh, relations and laying a more factual approach uh, to address it. Uh, these are complicated and complex uh, issues, and they really deserve uh, attention to uh, facts, figures, trends, and nuance, not just are you with us or against us, or uh, as uh, we sometimes say, my way or the Huawei. Nice. There you are again with the pith. Listen, I, that article is really good. The day it came out, my inbox lit up. People, you know, all over the Middle East and Washington were sending it to me and saying, oh, wow, you got to check this out. Really good article. We'll put a link to that on the show page. Asaf, thank you so much. Uh, look forward to chatting with you again soon. To our audience, thanks thank for you. joining us. Thank you. Inshallah. And see you soon. For audience, thanks for joining us. Follow us on social media. Subscribe, review, and rate us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you next month with another episode. Thank you very much. <laughs>